Our topic today is the discussion of progressive alternatives in the context of European social democracy. But before I go on to that topic of enormous importance uh, to us and to the future, uh, I do want to signal two issues, two related issues that were left unexplored in the conversation about the alternatives in the context of the United States, uh, in the hope that we can come back to those two issues at another moment in the court. Uh, and those two issues are two uh, potential powerful obstacles to the pursuit of such an alternative in the United States. And at the same time, two questions of enormous importance in their own right, uh, which are uh, the way of dealing with racial injustice and discrimination, and therefore with the relation between race and class, and the conflict of moral and religious agendas in the country as evidenced in the treatment of abortion. Uh, now, these have been described as the so-called wedge issues because they divide or inhibit the formation of a progressive majority in the country. Uh, the dominant approach to racial discrimination in the United States <clears throat> has separated race from class and treated racial injustice as a threshold issue to be addressed separately and previously to economic injustice. And the characteristic expression of this integrationist orthodoxy has been affirmative action. Now I will simply state dogmatically my, an objection to this, to this dominant approach, which is that uh, in separating race from class, as in the example of American of affirmative action, it produces three great detriments. The first is that it generates benefits that are in inverse proportion to the need for them. It most benefits the black professional and business bourgeoisie, the black professional business class. To a lesser extent, it benefits the organized black working class, such as policemen and firemen, especially public employees. But least of all, it benefits those who, would, who most require help, which is the mass of the black underclass, uh, stuck in the unstable part of the labor market. The second detriment is that it separates the black elite from the mass of poor blacks, and the third uh, detriment is that it offends the white working class majority of the country, which with some justification believes itself to be the victim of a conspiracy between the virtual representatives of the blacks, the black professional and business class, and the sanctimonious white elites. Now, there is an alternative, and it is an alternative which was only outlined but quickly suppressed earlier in American history in the years immediately following the Civil War. Under the watch of the Freedmen's Bureau in the South, especially between 1865 and 1869. An alternative that insisted in combining the struggle against class or economic injustice with the struggle against racial injustice. 
So such an alternative today might distinguish clearly between the collective promotion of the disadvantaged, those who find themselves uh, imprisoned in a circumstance of exclusion and inequality from which they are unable to escape by the forms of collective action that are available to them. And the prohibition of individualized racial discrimination. So the collective problem would be dealt with by collective and institutional means, not racial disadvantage alone, but the combination of forms of disadvantage, especially class and race, that results in this circumstance of almost inescapable disadvantage and exclusion. But individualized racial discrimination would be treated as a separate matter and even criminalized as it is in many countries. And the general access of such an alternative would be the insistence on combining with respect to the collective or structural problem, race and class, which are now disassociated in the United States as the result of the ascendancy of this integrationist orthodoxy. Now, no less important and contentious is the second obstacle to the formation of a progressive majority in the country, which is the conflict of moral or religious agendas. So the progressives in the United States have engaged in a culture war and a war of ethical views. And they have attempted to entrench their view in the form of federal law and interpretation of the federal constitution. And here too, the result is to provoke a division in any potential progressive majority in the country. Now there is a clear alternative to this position, although it is an alternative that is painful to many of the progressives. Uh, and that is the abandonment of the attempt to entrench in the form of law or constitutional interpretation of federal law one of these moral agendas against the other. Uh, the so-called secular or modernist moral agenda against the so-called religious or traditionalist moral agenda. And the issue on this alternative would be devolved to the states, which would then in all likelihood have very different positions with respect to the same problem of abortion. And as Americans have done many times in the past, and as they did uh, during the period of struggle against slavery, uh, Women needing abortion who were found themselves in states that prohibited abortion uh, would be able to go through, with a system of collective support to the permissive states. I, I don't want to discuss this now. We're going to postpone that discussion. I simply want to signal the issue because obviously it's, a, uh, it, it's, an, it's an intense issue of debate in the country. I want to signal what I want to postpone to later. Uh, but the argument against the entrenchment of one of these two positions in federal law and constitutional interpretation is not merely a strategic argument. Uh, it is also an argument of substance or on the merits. Both a secular humanist uh, and a believer uh, a Christian or a Jew uh, might have reason to think, for myself, I believe they do have reason to think 
that both of these moral agendas, as they are now formulated in the country, are primitive. Uh, one speaks to a heartless, legalistic moralism, and the other to an ethic of gratification. Uh, and it is in the interest of the country, on this view, that the dialectic between these two primitive moral agendas continue, rather than allowing one to be entrenched in law and in constitution against the other, so that the people can be brought to a higher level of moral insight. Now, that's all I want to say by way of the uh, discussion of these two issues, and I'm perfectly <coughs> conscious of how far they stand in opposition to the views that now prevail among the American progressives. So I promise that we'll come back to this very important discussion uh, later in the course. Now, with that, uh, I turn to European social democracy. Uh, and this is a theme of uh, central significance to the exploration of progressive alternatives in the world. The reason is that for a long time, European social democracy has been throughout the world the default position of the progressives. It has even been or become the default position of the progressives within the United States to the extent that they do not simply idealize the New Deal and take it as the model for their current position, they would like the United States to become more like the Sweden of the 1970s. So it's very important to understand the significance of the historical experience of European social democracy. I propose to divide my discussion into three large steps. First, the characterization of social democracy, what it is, how to interpret it, to understand it, and to assess its most important historical achievements. The second part of the discussion is what has happened to it, how it has evolved and why. Any engagement with an alternative in the European context has to be informed by a causal understanding of the historical experience. And the third and most important part of the discussion is then the pursuit of the alternative in the European context. And uh, that then is another path in which to develop our understanding of the contemporary alternatives by analogy to the American context and to the others that we'll explore in the course. So first, what is social democracy as it has developed in Europe? And I want now to prevent a to propose a realistic, unsentimental understanding of social democracy, not its own understanding on its, uh, uh, on its own terms, but an understanding from the outside. And to do that in two steps by two approximations. So the first approximation, which I mentioned very early on in the course, is that we can understand social democracy as a historical compromise. The forces that challenge the established arrangements of production and of power renounce this challenge or were made to renounce it. And in return for this abdication, <coughs> the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the market order more intensively, 
to attenuate the inequalities generated in the market through retrospective and compensatory redistribution by progressive taxation and social spending, and to manage the economy counter-cyclically, especially through the use of fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, now here is a second approximation to the definition of social democracy. <coughs> Equally unsentimental. So in this second understanding, we can, un we can define social democracy by the combination of three sets of arrangements. The first set of arrangements established a distinction between insiders and outsiders, primarily in the labor market, and to a secondary extent in the market for corporate control. So the insiders were the workers benefiting from stable employment, especially in the capital intensive parts of the, of the production system. And most significantly, in mass production industry, which was the core historical basis of the left or left-leaning parties. And everyone else, the other workers in the capital-starved parts of the economy and in the less benefited and organized parts of the labor market. Now, it is often said that there is a decisive distinction to make between those European societies Uh, such as Germany, un often under the sway of the Christian Democrat centrist political forces that made labor and social benefits depend on the particular job and therefore accentuated this division between the quasi-tenured workers and everyone else and the more universalistic social democracies, especially the Scandinavian or Dutch social democracy, uh, that to some extent detached the social and labor protections from the possession of a particular job and made them more inclusive. Nevertheless, even in that second type of European country, there was dualism in the labor market and in practice a distinction between the organized and the unorganized, those who were in the capital rich and those who were in the capital starved parts of the production system. Now the same fundamental distinction between insiders and outsiders also appeared in the market for corporate control. The arrangements in political economy on the whole benefited the incumbents, the controlling shareholders of established enterprise against the challengers. Uh, limited or orchestrated competition and favored, for example, cross holdings in the control of different companies that would stabilize the, pre the, the incumbent controlling groups. The second set of institutional arrangements defining historical social democracy were those that are sometimes described under the labels of social contract or incomes policies. 
it was the negotiation or orchestration of deals between organized labor and big business under the watch of the state. And these were deals that were designed to establish the allocation of benefits and costs of different macroeconomic policies, policies of economic growth and employment and to limit distributive conflict in the interest of both economic growth and social stability. So the organized, the insiders, made these deals with each other at the provocation of the state, which orchestrated uh, these arrangements. The third set of institutions, of policies, of arrangements that defined historical social democracy was the achievement of a very high level of redistributive social entitlement paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. So we discussed this before in the American context. Despite the quasi or semi-egalitarian commitments of social democracy, it discovered that the best way to raise the tax take was to rely heavily on the most price-neutral form of taxation, the comprehensive flat rate value-added tax, or the closest <coughs> functional equivalent to it. And on this basis, it achieved a very high level of tax take, which financed a very high level of investment in people and in their capabilities. And uh, no right-wing political force in any major European country has ever succeeded, or for the most part, even tried to undermine this achievement. Uh, now, let me stop there first, because that's just an initial definition of what social democracy historically was. Now, I want to say next, it's become something else to some extent as the result of a transformation. But let me stop there and just add to that account a remark about its greatest accomplishments. So we could say there are two, and they're intimately related. The first I just mentioned, it's to have achieved a very high level of investment in people and in their capabilities. And the second is to create a package of rights and benefits to the individual citizen and worker that has been to some extent safeguarded against the market, against economic instability. So in some sense, taken out of the market. Now we can relate this to an earlier discussion we had. This is what I called in another moment in the course, the haven. Now, in a larger view, we could say the haven is just the other side of the storm. So the individual has to be rendered unafraid 
and protected and capable in this haven <coughs> of immunities and capability assuring endowments so that he can go out into the world and raise a storm or so that there can be a storm of experiment, of innovation and conflict and he will remain able to act and fearless in that storm. Now, of course, a fundamental qualification to the historical achievement of social democracy, as I have just defined it, is that it has the part about the haven, but the part about the storm is largely missing. Of course, not just missing from the discourse and practice of the European Social Democrats, but missing from the discourse and practice of the progressives all over the world. For the most part, their orientation has been humanizing and pietistic rather than structural and transformative. And that is why, according to my claims at the beginning of the course, they appear on the stage of history as the humanizers of the inevitable. Humanizing the project of their conservative adversaries, putting a human face on it, rather than embodying a different version of the message of energy, of innovation, of construction. Well, let me stop there, because that's just the first moment in the, in the discussion and ask whether you have some comment about this initial characterization of social democracy. Yes? Um, when you mentioned that the state orchestrates the deals between the... In, yeah, in the social compacts in or income policies. Yes. Uh, you mentioned this limits the redistributive conflict. So what does that mean? Uh, well, so, so the idea is that in any course of economic policy, monetary and fiscal policy, or, strat or national strategies of economic growth, different policies and different strategies have different effects for the main groups in society. So every policy, has a every policy produces benefits, and costs. And it distributes these benefits and costs in different ways. So then there's a distributive conflict over these policies because they have differential effects. So then if this distributive conflict is aggravated, if it is not resolved, then the danger is that everyone will lose. That's the idea. And uh, will be harmed by inconclusive distributive conflict. So the state takes the initiative under this idea, and it then organizes these deals. So, and especially deals between the two most important organized elements in the economy, in the society, which are organized labor and big business. Organized labor then has to speak both for itself and presumably as the virtual representative of the unorganized, the others, given this division between insiders and outsiders. But of course, in practice, it speaks mainly for itself. So that's the idea. And distributive, unresolved distributive conflict would manifest itself in many ways. For example, one way in which it might manifest itself might be inflation. Because one of the ways to understand inflation, runaway or chronic inflation, is that it is the expression of unresolved distributive conflict. So the idea is let's avoid that, let's make a deal. And the initiative in making the deal, in calling the organized interest to the state, to the table, is the initiative of the central government. 
Yeah. So when you say that social democrats are trying to unionize the conservative division of the world, do you mean that they then accept that, except for like the investment in capabilities, and then they create this like safe haven, as you say, in rights, they accept that people should be free to satisfy their own like individual preferences? Is that the part? No, I think the, so it goes back to, to my, to the first of my two definitions of social democracy, which is the idea of a historical compromise. So up to the period following the First World War, there was unresolved conflict about the organization of the state and of the production system. And the two European wars, the world wars of the 20th century, were related to this unresolved conflict. So what is essential in the genealogy of social democracy is that the scope of conflict was decisively narrow. And the, the, the fundamental arrangements are accepted, not just the abstract form of the market, but a particular kind of market order. And then it's within that terrain that social democracy does its work. So, Take the example of Sweden, which is often mythologized in the world. So the whole world looks to Sweden. In my country, I think the uh, dominant political idea is that we would like to be a tropical Sweden. <laughs> and so in, in my country, everyone professes to be a social something or other, a social liberal or a social democrat. And if you ask, what does the social mean? The social is the sugar, with which we are to sugarcoat the bitter pill of the market order and its consequences. And the specialty of the politicians is then the distribution in practice, or just in rhetoric, of this sugar. So then at some point, the people become impatient, and they say, we don't want just sugar. We want the real thing. Uh, and that then initiates uh, a change in the direction of national politics. Uh, that was my reference. So in Sweden, so that's the mythological Sweden. They think it's the generalized distribution of the sugar. Now, we know it wasn't like that way that what happened in the real Sweden, the historical Sweden, is that in the earlier part of the 20th century, there were many decades of conflict over access to economic and political power. And this conflict ended in a compromise between the social democratic state and the plutocratic families that to this day continue to own much of the Swedish production system. So they were not <coughs> expropriated. They were not expelled from the control of the production apparatus. But their power was limited under a series of legal devices that the Swedes invented. So this is, that's a, a particular form of the compromise. And so then the redistributive welfare state is the epilogue to that narrative. The world doesn't see that. So it says, we want the epilogue, but without the previous narrative. And that's what's mythological about it. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of what it really was. Yes? So big question, but specific in the European context. Why do the powerful ever abide by what is the power? And what I'm asking is, why do the powerful ever abide by limits on their own power. And so in the context of European socialism, you're describing it as this grand compromise, but what maintains enforcement or adherence to the compromise over time as the distribution of power changes? Well, it's uh, uh, what we say that they sacrifice the rings so as not to sacrifice the fingers, right? So they. They give up what's inessential to preserve what's fundamental. So they've retained, they, 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 they remain owners, limited owners, through 
a series of devices such as trusts that are controlled or monitored by the state of much of the productive apparatus. If they insisted on radicalizing the conflict, they would risk losing everything. And so there's a, there's a comp this is the compromise. This is the deal that was struck. Well, just what I'm getting at is the US context, Germany, for example, put yes. workers on boards, which is a way of solidifying their power over time. Versus in the United States, there was a concerted effort to attenuate the power of labor, even despite some initial agreements. <coughs> Well, but I, th I think that's too... This is simplistic, but the question is yeah. what maintains a compromise over time? What's the theory of why this is self-enforcing versus other deals between just generalizing capital labor don't seem to be self-enforcing? So in the United States, of course, uh, the compromise took the di different form of the New Deal. And Ro Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal did impose constraints on the money classes in the United States. Not the, exactly the same constraints that were imposed, for example, by the Swedish state on the family plutocracies. Uh, and in Sweden, you could say that the plutocratic control of the economy by a small number of families is much more accentuated than it is in the United States, uh, despite these myths. So uh, now, if you then ask the question, well, why don't they try to break the deal? The answer is that eventually, later on, they do try to break it. Uh, the, the reason to hesitate in breaking the deal is obvious, that you might overturn everything. You might lose and find that you were much worse that you're much worse off at the end of the struggle than you were before. Nevertheless, over time, these deals have been degraded. And what we often describe as neoliberalism is, in a sense, an attempt to overturn the deal, to limit it, to hollow it out in, in different ways. And that would be then the next part of the discussion. Yes? I guess I also see, like, direct economic benefits, for example. So back to the whole like right, so capitalism textures, it seems like you have all these institutions in place that support them the incumbents, as you say, they have like some really powerful firms and they can also use labor as ways of like actually getting the workers to do their job but also to like uh, invest in skills, yes. etc. So it seems like they at least for a while actually yes. benefit the direct economy. Yeah, so so in other words, just interpreting further what you said. It's not just that they risk losing at the macro level in national politics. It's also that they risk losing in the micro, at the micro level through industrial strife in their enterprises. So it's, it's, it's a reasonable bet for them to make. And they come out way ahead. So there they are, richer than ever, uh, admired in the possession of their enterprises. Uh, so retrospectively, uh, what they have done is, is very reasonable from the standpoint of their, of their interest. I, I understand all these dynamics, and I'm just trying to push it a little further, which yeah. is, as we're describing, right, these capital literature, just there are a lot of different possible equilibriums between, you could think of it as the political and economic systems or capital and labor. And the question is, I think, if we're delving into the details, these equilibrium are fragile. Of course. And, and, and of so course. what I'm getting at is I, I understand in certain circumstances it can be Of course. So, so just to pursue that further, and that then becomes an important element in the story that follows about what happened to social democracy. So for example, a crucial basis of this set of deals was the background paradigm of production. When historical social democracy arose, the advanced practice of production was industrial mass production. So a stable labor force assembled in large productive units like factories under the aegis of large corporations. Then there's a change in the paradigm of production. And the knowledge economy arises. 
uh, in an insular form, this insular knowledge economy is accompanied by the reorganization of labor in decentralized contractual arrangements on a global scale. And that destabilizes the, the, the part of the economic basis of these deals. And then there's a rush, a grab, to see who can get most from the new arrangements. And in that ensuing struggle, of course, the owners of the capital assets are in an advantageous position. So that's part of the story that we tell next. Now, uh, so then the next question is, what has happened to social democracy? And a summary description of what has happened is that it has been hollowed out and attempted <coughs> to reinvent itself. So first understand the, the rhetorical structure of the objections to social democracy as I've just characterized social democracy. There have been two sets of objections. I'm not saying objections from the outside, objections from the inside. In the national debate and among the elites, First objection is economic cost and rigidity. So these arrangements, at least the first two sets of arrangements, <coughs> impose rigidities that exact <coughs> a large cost in output and in the rise of productivity. The second objection is the objection of unfairness that those arrangements, as they initially emerged, were predicated on the division between insiders and outsiders, especially unfairness in the labor market. But what then has happened? And how are we to understand why it has happened, apart from these familiar arguments about the defects of traditional social democracy. <clears throat> a simple way to tell the story is that social democracy, for the most part, get, gave up the first two sets of arrangements to keep the third. So it retreated to the last line of defense. It has given up progressively the arrangements that organize the labor market and to some extent the market for corporate control to the benefit of the insiders. And it has given up the practices that made possible the deals between big business and organized labor. And in giving up those two sets of arrangements, it has then retreated to the last line of defense, which is the preservation of a high level of taxation, a high tax take, making possible a high level of entitlements and of investment in people and their capabilities. And then it has tried to develop or to reinvent its other major historical achievement, the package of endowments and guarantees taken out of the market, protecting against economic vulnerability or insecurity. And the characteristic project that reveals this reinvention is so-called so, is so flex security. So it's the idea that the individual should have a package of safeguards or benefits not related to the job and universally portable as a way of reconciling flexibility with security. 
So the entrepreneurs, the owners of the capital assets will have greater freedom to recombine things, workers and resources, but the worker will be protected by a form of guarantee that doesn't depend on the possession of any particular job and that is portable among jobs. And we can see that as a characteristic expression of this idea of the haven. Of course, the part about the storm continues to be absent. Now, then social democracy is, in, in this sense, hollowed out. It retreats, it is eviscerated, and it is liberalized in the direction of this project of flex security. So the characteristic project of the North Atlantic elites then becomes to reconcile the social protection of the Europeans with the economic flexibility of the Americans. And we can ask whether this is a true synthesis or simply the rhetorical description of what has been, to a very large extent, simply a surrender or an evisceration. And why has this happened? So here are uh, four factors that have played a major role in the causal background to this transformation or evisceration of historical social democracy. The first is the one that I just mentioned a moment ago, <clears throat> the change in the paradigm of production. So the core historical constituency of the left or left-leaning political parties was organized labor headquartered in the capital-intensive parts of the economy, especially <coughs> mass production industry. And now we, we have the decline of mass production industry and the rise of the new advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy, in a confined or insular form, excluding the vast majority of workers and of firms. And one of the characteristic uh, corollaries of this insular form of the knowledge economy is the consignment of an increasing part of the labor force to conditions of precarious, temporary, or conditional employment. So the group of insiders diminishes or loses part of its prerogatives. And the, the range of outsiders expands. And now not just within the country, the national economy, but on a global scale. So the result is to undermine what was one of the most important parts of the basis of historical social democracy, that form of the organization of production. So let me pursue that for a moment because I'm going to come back to it later when we discuss the alternatives. We still tend to think that the natural form of the organization and representation of labor is this assembly of a stable <coughs> labor force in large productive units under the aegis of large corporations. But the truth is that that way of organizing labor prevailed in the world only for a relatively brief time from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. And it was preceded by several centuries during which labor was organized in the West 
on the basis of decentralized contractual arrangements rather than internalized within the firm. And that is what we know as the putting out system described by Karl Marx, for example, in the early chapters of Capital. So the worker works with his family or his friends, with his group at home. The capitalist provides material and machines. And there are contractual arrangements for the organization of production. They're not brought within the aegis of a firm. Now we witness, together with the insular knowledge economy, the emergence of a new putting out system, but on a global scale. And then it might be the case that in retrospect, we'll come to understand that what we think of as the natural form of the organization of labor was just a relatively brief interlude between these two long periods of the putting out system, before the middle of the 19th century and after the middle of the 20th century. And that has been a powerful change uh, undermining the historical basis of social democracy and calling for a completely different response. <clears throat> now, the second element, the second cause, which is connected with this first, is then the predominant form of globalization and the stresses and challenges to which it subjects the social democratic European economies. And in particular, as a result of the arrival on the world labor market of many hundreds of millions of Chinese and Indian workers in countries that have increasingly advanced technological and productive apparatus of their own. So the rivalry, the competition on a world scale, helping to drive down the, uh, the returns to labor and the bargaining power of labor vis-a-vis -vis capital. A third element in the causal background to the evisceration of social democracy has to do with the effect of migratory flows, especially within Europe, on the basis of social cohesion or social solidarity. So a simple test, a criterion of social solidarity is the willingness of people to make sacrifices for other people's children. Now, what you could say about the, the, the basis of social cohesion or solidarity in historical social democracy is that it consisted in money transfers organized by the state against the background of a large degree of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. Now, money is an inadequate social cement. But its inadequacy was masked so long as there was a high degree of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. So the European nations, many of them could be as like tribes, family, a family of families. And it's only against that background that the orchestration of money transfers seem to be an adequate device for the preservation of social solidarity. Now there are <laughs> migratory flows. The migratory flows increase. They result in the degradation 
of this background sameness, this tribalism, and that degradation exposes the inadequacy of money and the, the experiential foundation of this solidarity. Exciting conflict. And a fourth element in the causal background to this picture is the loss of ideological hegemony. without which we cannot understand, for example, the rise of neoliberalism. So it's the currents of thought in the high culture, penetrating the elites, the universities, the professions. And in Europe, as in much of the world, we have two main currents of thought. One current of thought is a fossilized Marxism, a shrunken Marxism. It receives from the spirit of the time a little axe. With this axe, it cuts Marxism in half. It throws out the, the good part, the transformative aspirations, and it keeps the bad part, the historical fatalism. So that's one current of thought. And the other current of thought is the imitation of uh, American-style social science. Uh, most notably, the most influential discipline, economics. <coughs> Making the predominant form of the market order appear to be natural or necessary. Uh, now, to give you just a little example, because it may seem that this is an evanescent or distant influence of ideology, but it's not so. So take, for example, the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics. It was invented in the 1950s by the Swedish Central Bank during a period of its conflict with the social democratic government. And it wanted to raise the prestige of so-called economic science, in the name of which there would be constraints on economic alternatives. And it had the very clever and outrageous idea of calling its prize the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Uh, the family of Alfred Nobel uh, brought a lawsuit in Sweden to prevent this, uh, uh, this fraudulent prize from being established. And they lost their lawsuit because it's very hard to prevent someone uh, from pretending to pay homage to a dead person uh, by using his name for a prize. And the prize is then, er, every year, announced to the defenders of this pseudoscience. And from time to time, they give the prize to a representative of the loyal opposition who has a humanizing and pietistic approach to economic life. Uh, so uh, uh, this, this is all part of the background to this situation in which the ideas uh, have been used to tilt the scales against the more progressive or transformative impulses of social democracy and adverse ideological hegemony. <coughs> so that's the situation. That's what we have. We have this liberalized or hollowed out social democracy. Uh, it's what remains. It, it does have those achievements that I've described. It's tried to reinvent itself, as in the flex security. It's a very limited reinvention. We have to go much further. And it seems that it can't go much further without abandoning the limits of the historical compromise in which it began. That is, the original abdication from any attempt 
to reshape in more fundamental ways the arrangements of power and production. So my central claim then in the third part of the discussion is that none of the structural problems of these societies can be solved or even addressed within the limits of the anti-structural social democratic compromise. But before I go, I go on to the programmatic discussion, let me stop again and ask you about this account of the evolution or transformation of social democracy. Yes. I wanted to come back to the idea of the insular knowledge economy and the lack of solidarity in those arrangements. Yes. Um, I guess I'm a little bit perhaps more kind of like cautiously optimistic about some of the very recent and anecdotal trends we see in US tech workers, those particularly that are organizing against their companies uh, rolling out technologies yes. um, in the practice of separating children from their parents for wise <coughs> practices. But what particularly makes me a little bit more hopeful is that their demands are not restricted to their company's immediate practices, but they're also kind of developing a wider network of solidarity with uh, existing kind of grassroots yes. movements on immigration and so on. So yes. do you see that as like a potential avenue that of course. can functionally work the way uh, unions did? Of course. So this world is full of points of resistance, of little resistances, little revolutions, little epiphanies, of course. And uh, nothing, uh, and what I said, is meant to suggest that this evolution that I've described is somehow just a narrowing funnel, that it denies us possibilities. On the contrary, I, I want to argue just the opposite, that it's full of possibilities, but to exploit those possibilities, we need to go beyond the horizon of historical social democracy. That's the basic <coughs> argument. And we need to go beyond it, especially with respect to the fundamental institutional arrangements of the economy and of the state. That was always the central point, whether we'll accept those arrangements and attempt to humanize them, or whether we'll innovate in those arrangements. And then we have this powerful, dissuasive intellectual force that comes from the history of social theory, which is the notion that there's a system. It's capitalism. It has laws. It's a logic. And the alternative to it would be the replacement of that system by another system, it's the binary idea of politics that I mentioned at the beginning of the course. So if systemic change is impossible or too dangerous, what's left to do is to humanize the existing world. The idea of revolution is turned on its head and becomes an alibi for its opposite. So we, 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 we can't understand this transformation without taking into account the power of those ideas. And so in everything that I want to propose here in this conversation with you, uh, a, a crucial theme is the association of the structural with the fragmentary. We associate structural change with wholesale change, instantaneous change, and often violent change. And gradual, stepwise, or fragmentary change with superficial change. <clears throat> but that's false. Because the real structural change that happens in the world is almost invariably fragmentary, piecemeal. And the idea of wholesale change is just a limiting case, and for the most part, a fantasy. But I agree entirely with the implication of your, of your remark. So I, I don't think that the 
the causal account that I gave would necessarily be rejected by the ideologists and defenders of social democracy. They would say, what's the alternative? And our hands are forced. There are no alternatives. It's, it's difficult enough to preserve the basics of the social democratic achievement. And here you are asking that we go forward and demand more. So it's a, it's a discussion about the minimum and the maximum. And my answer in that conversation would be, we can't even preserve the minimum unless we struggle for much more. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to compare this evolution of social democracy with the evolution of one of its main instruments, which is Keynesian economics. So uh, Keynes was a very brilliant, but also very worldly, and wanted to shine in his own time. And that's why some of his occasional journalistic writings uh, from the 1920s and 30s are more profound than his theoretical writing. So he made a very conscious decision to focus his general theoretical work, his general theory of 1936, on not just a particular form of the slump, but a particular response to the slump, a response that focused on demand rather than, for example, on any attempt to gain control of the investment decision. He didn't want to be mistaken for a leftist. And he regarded any alternative to a demand focus as politically unpalatable and dangerous. So he diminished his theoretical vision already in its theoretical formulation to suit what he regarded as convenient. Right after his work, only one year later, his disciple, John Hicks, uh, produced a formulaic interpretation of the general theory, the familiar curves, the ISLM curves, that made it possible to present it as a, for textbooks for the mass of students. And so having been downsized before it was born, Keynesianism was then immediately downsized in a second stage for this generalized assimilation. <clears throat> then the third stage was it's appropriated by the American disciples of Keynes, led, for example, by, by Samuelson. Uh, who, rather than interpreting it as the germ, the seed, of an alternative economic theory, Uh, dealt with it as the theory of fiscal and monetary policy. <coughs> so it was ambiguous in Keynes's own formulation. Was it a theory of low-level equilibrium, or was it a theory of permanent disequilibrium? Was it the beginning of an alternative paradigm, or was it simply an addition to marginalist economics? So what the American followers of Keynes did was to transform what had been at least the kernel of an alternative theory into a different chapter of the same textbook. So Keynesian economics, downsized in this way, was then relabeled macroeconomics, the theory of fiscal and monetary policy. And the pre-existing body of economic theory created by the marginalist theoreticians was 
relabeled microeconomics. Then it became two chapters of the same textbook, rather than two rival theoretical paradigms. Then once that had happened, it became possible for there to be an increasing uprising against Keynesianism within economics. Under the label of the micro foundations of macroeconomics. And they began to say, everything that's true in this theory can be inferred from microeconomics. And what can't be inferred from microeconomics, such as the so called fiscal multiplier, is false. So, in adopting the strategy of peaceful coexistence with the dominant way of thinking about the economy, it sets itself up for destruction. That's what happened to Keynesian economics. And it's, it is the intellectual counterpart to this story about social democracy. Uh, it is progressively hollowed out, eviscerated, liberalized, but no degree of surrender is ever enough. The strategy of appeasement works no less well in the history of ideas and of politics uh, than in, uh, in our world affairs and world conflicts. Uh, well, so we come then to the third and crucial part of the discussion about the alternative. And I then want to focus on four sets of arrangements or initiatives that would represent a break with this historical compromise of social democracy and address the unresolved structural problems, the problems that on this argument, social democracy is unable to solve or even to address. And I want to begin with one which is squarely within the horizon of the conventional political debates and is an example of a bridge between the existing ideological conflict and the missing ideological conflict. And that concerns the provision and quality of public services. That, after all, is at the center of conventional political conflict. But I want to address it in a way which suggests how it can be a link then to the, to the missing structural agenda. So the idea is this. The state has an obligation to provide by way of public services a universal minimum to the citizens. That's part of the conventional social democratic orthodoxy. Let's call that the floor. And the state should also operate at the ceiling in the development of the most advanced experimental and costliest public service. But in the broad middle area between the floor and the ceiling, the state should engage independent civil society, help organize it, <clears throat> finance it, equip it, monitor it, so that organized civil society acting through social organizations or cooperatives of different kinds can partner with the state in the experimental and competitive provision of public services. So the motivation for this idea is the following. What do we have in the world by way of the provision of public services? We have what you could call administrative Fordism. By analogy to Fordist mass production. That is the provision of standardized, low-quality services 
by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. And what do I mean by low quality? I mean services of lower quality than the analogous services that could be bought on the market by those who have money. And the only alternative to that administrative Fordism seems to be the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. But in fact, there's another alternative, which is that beyond this floor of the universal minimum, the state partner with independent civil society, not for profit, in the experimental and competitive provision of public services as the best way of enhancing the quality. And uh, 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 an immense benefit of this alternative would be to help provoke the self-organization of civil society outside the state. Uh, only an organized society can generate alternatives and act on them. And this would be a, a, a direction, yes? It's just like a clarifying question. Do, do you mean that like the <coughs> public services are bad, have a low quality by design? No, no. It's that what the state provides uh, as a universal in standardized form has lower quality than what can be bought on the market by those who have money. Now, how do we enhance the quality of public services? We can't enhance their quality unless we're able to experiment. <clears throat> and to experiment, we have to engage the professionals, the specialists in civil society, and not just those who are the current employees of the state. So what are public services? <clears throat> public services are the building of people. And civil society builds itself by, by participating together with the state in the provision of public services. Now, we have no extended experience of that. We have fragmentary experience in the third sector. But we have to be organized. And we have to have a legal form. The jurists in the 20th century theorized that in between private law and public law, there would be a third area of social law. Organizing the engagement of civil society in the provision of, of services. That's the basic idea. And, and it's obviously something which is close to what already exists. Because there are already, in many countries, experiments in this direction. And because the subject of the enhancement of the quality of public services is a standard theme of the established political context. So that's an example of how to take an idea which is entirely conventional and, and give it another spin that opens it up in a certain direction. Now, shall I go on to the second? Yes. Yeah, I, I, heard, I heard that the Korean has a policy, the government uh, actually provide the communication infrastructure for the media industry of Korea can be prevailed. Yes. Is that you know, what do you mean that the government should you know, participate in the social innovation? Or is only the public side? The government, so, so the idea is, so if you take the example of education, the government sh shouldn't simply subcontract to private interests, much less for profit, a, a part of this responsibility. But it should be able to tap the talent, the energy, the innovative and experimental potential of independent civil society acting not for profit, and uh, allow it to participate in the alternative or experimental provision of public services. So long as this experimental provision is something that is additional, rather than something that takes the place of the universal minimum. That's the basic idea. 
And there have to be a, a set of characteristic legal forms of legal vehicles. So civil society is then energized and organized through this engagement in the provision of public services. And this is a, a vast frontier, which is in some way effacing the clear-cut boundary between the state apparatus and the so-called third sector. But most of the time, what happens often is that the political party eventually will be in a cash out this kind of uh, investment and try to manipulate it. Of course. Even though, you know, you know, who represents the political party? Once they involve in the civil society to the innovation, eventually what is something, you know, feedback will be. But it, it can't be done, obviously, under centralized control or allocation. So it has to be done in the form of legal vehicles, such as trusts or social organizations or cooperatives that have a large degree of protected autonomy from the central government. It requires a legal framework, and it requires a distinct form of law. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not the state acting through a series of proxies that the state, in fact, controls. That would entirely lead to the degeneration of the system. Now, you had a remark, too. Yes. Uh um, somewhat similar lines. Uh, I was wondering, isn't there a, a conflict between the incentives and the accountability that would arise from uh, the state and the, uh, the, the civil society you know, sharing some of this responsibility of providing the public service? And, and there's also the risk of the civil society or, or the role of the civil society being appropriated through politics or of course, yeah, of and, course. and not remaining of independent. Of course, of course, but, but that's why we would have to have a distinct legal organization of this sector. What can't happen is what happens now. Civil society is alienated from the part, except through the public employees, from the provision of the public services that are decisive for its own formation. And in being alienated, it is also disorganized. There is no universal organization of civil society. The best way to provoke the self-organization of civil society outside the state is to give it a task. And so it's organized around a task. And the most important task is building itself through, through this equipment for people, which is the real substance of public services. What would the incentive be for the civil society to build itself? Because they would be remunerated, but not for profit. Cooperatives of educators, of physicians, of architects, of every profession, of every specialty. And that's what happens now uh, in uh, a large part of the educational or medical establishment in these societies is not for profit. Uh, and it, and it doesn't mean that it is not remunerated. Uh, so it's a question of how we're going to organize it in relation to the responsibilities of the state. All I wanted to do was to suggest that there's a potential connection between the existing debates and the missing debates. And I'm giving this as an example of such a connection. Yes? Building up that point, I think this gets at the crux of your thesis, which is if you're trying to enlist a civil society and you need an incentive structure, but it's and there is remuneration, but it's not for profit. Yes. This idea of there being a non-for-profit or organizational form, I think, requires a second set of questions, which is then how do you change the corporate form or create those organizations to exist in the first place? Because right now, that's it's hard to form a non-profit-driven organization that is economically self-sustainable. Which, but, but you give the examples of non-profit <coughs> doctors. They're non-profit in name only. So I, what I'm getting at is that the organizational form that's so prevalent, that's been so normalized, is profit maximization. But what you're describing requires a new alternative organizational Absolutely. form. Absolutely. It does require a new alternative. But taking the medical example, the, the, <coughs> the, the 
most advanced medical establishment, or the, the teaching hospitals associated with the universities. And I don't think it's, you, we, we can discuss their advantages and disadvantages, but it's not correct, in my view, to say that they're non-for-profit in name only. The, 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 put aside the question of the administration of these entities and the legal forms under which they're administrated, the professionals who are at their heart are, are, are really non-for-profit. You can, you can, you can, we can control their remuneration and make them accountable, as you were suggesting. So, so but, but, and that goes beyond how they are now. So I'm going to go into the details of this one. This is okay. I've done a project looking yes. at the finance statements of non-profit hospitals. They yeah. have billions of dollars in extra revenue. Yeah. A big problem for, there's a lawsuit at UMass, uh, not UMass, uh, Mass yes. General, about this specific issue. Maybe the doctors in their hearts are not are not for profit. They care about the delivery. Of Absolutely. But the management is Absolutely. adopted in neoliberal. Absolutely. So so that's that's absolutely right. So so that so that this can't be simply the continuation of the present form of non for profits, as in that example. So it requires then some the development of some actual form of accountability makes it non for profit in fact and not just in appearance. So what I'm trying to get at, and this is I'm a PhD student organization yes. behavior, is I think Part of what we need to really spend a lot of energy on is defining how we create these new organizational forms. Because yes. a lot of what we're talking about is predicated on that. Yes. And in my opinion, they don't exist. Or there's only a sliver of that. that yes. So I think one concrete example in the healthcare space is the Cleveland um, Clinic, where the compensation model and incentives um, is essentially a flat fee. And they've, they found a sweet spot where you're not compensating physicians on a fee-for-service basis. So you don't have an incentive to perform an MRI or an additional exam or procedure on a defensive medicine basis. But you're compensated sufficiently above the curves. So you're uh, feeling like you're uh, meeting the prestige <coughs> and um, educational requirements of the field. But it's not contingent upon the services you're providing. So I think they, they are, there, there are a, a handful perhaps, but a, but a number of concrete models where you've seen a reduction in procedures, a reduction in non-elective, unnecessary uh, uh, work with uh, increase in uh, quality of care and yeah. patient comfort. So the fundamental problem, apart from the adequacy of any particular solution, is that the two models that we have which are administrative Fordism and privatization are inadequate. And uh, there's no administrative counterpart. There's no counterpart in the provision of public services to the knowledge economy. And that's what we would need. Uh, and so it's absolutely right that the particular form of that doesn't exist, and that we would have to find it experimentally. But it's an immense task in which, which is justified on the one hand by the practical importance, but on the other hand by this provocation to organize civil society outside the state and to create legal vehicles for this organization. Now, uh, then we go beyond the horizon of the existing debates and we come to this fundamental question of the hierarchical segmentation of the production system. The rise of the knowledge economy and its confinement to fringes that exclude the vast majority of workers and firms. What are the crucial changes that would make possible both the deepening and the dissemination of the knowledge economy? So there would cease to be this, this set of fringes. So there are two. One in 
the institutional <coughs> arrangements of the market order, <coughs> determining access to uh, credit, advanced practice, and advanced technology, and the other in education. So let's imagine a sequence of steps or stages. In the first step, the aim is to expand access to the crucial resources and opportunities of production. Uh, credit, practice, technology, knowledge. And access for whom? First of all, access for the backward firms, the small and medium-sized firms, that are the most important part of the production system and are responsible for the vast majority of jobs and of output but also for the individual <coughs> agents who are outside firms. So, and the strategic place to begin is the middle part of the job structure. So for example, the nurse practitioner or the repair person or the IT person and we imagine that we then begin to form a cadre of technologically equipped artisans in the middle part of the job structure, requiring assistance in skilling, in monitoring, and in support. And then from that middle part of the job structure, you go down to the lower parts of the job structure, janitorial staff, or shelf stackers in supermarket and drugstore chains, and you go up to the liberal professions, lawyers, engineers, doctors, architects. So the broadening of access to those crucial productive resources and capabilities, and the development of a mechanism to determine what works and to disseminate what works, the successful experiments. Let's say that's the object of the first stage. Then in the second stage, you begin to develop a new institutional architecture of the market order. Along the lines I suggested in an earlier conversation, it's not the American model of arm's length regulation of business by government, and it's not the Northeast <coughs> Asian model of imposition of unitary trade and industrial policy top down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. It's a form of strategic coordination between government and firms that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental in the service of this attempt to deepen and disseminate the knowledge economy. And if you say that's what we do on the vertical axis of the relations between the government and the firms, on the horizontal axis of the relations among firms, we promote a regime of cooperative competition so that they can compete against one another as the early 19th century farmers did but achieve economies of scale by pooling some of their resources. And then in the third stage, much further into the future, we begin to develop alternative regimes of property and contract, alternative ways of organizing the radical decentralization of the economic order. So the existing property and contract regime becomes only one of those variants. And the market order is not fastened to a single version of itself. There's the traditional unified property right in some areas. It has the advantage of allowing an entrepreneur to do something in which no one else believes. But in other areas, we organize <coughs> de 
disaggregated, derivative, fragmentary forms of property so that different stakeholders, workers, local governments, local communities, can have superimposed claims on the same productive <coughs> resources. The market order ceases to be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. Different regimes of property and contract come to coexist experimentally in the same market order. That's the institutional change. And the crucial analytic premise is that a market order has no single natural and necessary form of itself. It's not enough to regulate the market. It's not enough to compensate for its inequalities through retrospective correction by redistributive spending and progressive taxation. We have to be able to innovate in the legal constitution of the market order. And to a practical end, which is the end of deepening and disseminating the knowledge of now, let's say that's one crucial inflection. The other inflection is the provision of the kind of education that the knowledge economy requires, both as general education and as technical education. It requires a form of education that, is, that gives priority to the analytic, that prefers selective depth to encyclopedic superficiality, that is cooperative, uh, and that approaches every subject from contrasting points of view. And in its method of technical education, its focus is not on job-specific and machine-specific skills, but on generic and flexible capabilities, higher order capabilities required for the use of numerically controlled machine tools. So this is a large project. And it's, it's a project which is completely different from the idea of simply trying to buy a few more years for declining mass production industries. And it would be one of the great projects of, 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 that would then ensue on this attempt to go beyond the historical horizon of social democracy. Now then, let me add a third element, because it's intimately related to this first one. And that has to do with labor. So again, there are two dominant discourses about labor in the world today and in Europe. There's the traditional discourse of the defense of the rights of organized labor. And the impulse of that discourse is to want to suppress as illegal any attempt to organize labor on the basis of temporary <coughs> or conditional employment. So the, there are two problems. One problem is that the traditional labor discourse serves the interests of the organized minority, but not of what has become the disorganized majority. And the second problem is that it is impossible to abolish by decree the new relations of production of this new putting out system. <clears throat> so that's the traditional labor discourse. The alternative to it is the neoliberal discourse, which under the label of flexibility, then wants to consign the majority of the labor force to radical economic insecurity, the condition of precarious employment. So we would need to have a third position. As the counterpart to this project of developing the inclusive knowledge economy, And the third position would say, we will accept that the, the old model of 
labor and production cannot be restored by decree. But we will not allow the new form to result in radical and generalized economic insecurity. So we have to organize and represent these fragmented employees, labor performed under conditions of decentralized contractual arrangements. And to the extent that we can't organize and represent it adequately, there has to be direct legal intervention in the employment relations. For example, to assure the price neutrality of labor, the labor performed under temporary conditions is remunerated at a comparable level to labor performed in conditions of stable employment. So these, these two projects, of the inclusive knowledge economy and of the reorganization of the status of labor are parallel projects. And in the light of this project of labor, then the, 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 the device of, of flex security would be only a beginning. That is, it acquires a higher meaning in this context. It's a point of departure and not a point of arrival. Now, do you see there that how intimately these, this second and third set of themes are connected? <coughs> the, 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 the deepening and dissemination of the labor, of the market economy, and the, and the transformation of the status of labor. Uh, so this would be like historical social democracy in the sense that it's concerned centrally with inclusion and empowerment, but it would be unlike it because it then intervenes in the structure, in the institutional background of the market order. Now, uh, I'm going to continue this discussion of European social democracy uh, next week to add at least two more sets of innovations to this description of the project. But I want to anticipate a theme of a completely different order. So these are all institutional themes, saying social democracy is defined by the acceptance of the established institutional arrangements. The alternative to it is a democratization of the market order and a deepening of democracy, radicalization of the experimentalist impulse. We're not simply attempting to humanize the market order, we're reinventing it. But there is a spiritual issue, and this is the point that I wanted to anticipate. So it's not just that historical social democracy leaves the established institutional order unchanged and even unchallenged, is that it accepts a spiritual premise that we would have reason to contest. And the spiritual premise is that it's natural for human life to be little. Now, this is a fundamental rhythm of European life in the 20th century. <clears throat> when there were wars, the Europeans woke up, and war is heroic and rescues us from the long littleness of life. And then peace is reestablished, and we go back to sleep again and satisfy ourselves with consumption. And so the, what's at stake in this contest about historical social democracy <coughs> is the level of our ambition for human life, who we are. And 
there's this idea that it's not enough to become more equal. We want to become bigger. And we can become bigger only together if we become bigger together. And we shouldn't depend on trauma in the form of war and economic ruin to awaken us. Uh, so, of course, this is very difficult to, to address in a, in a national discourse. But it's fundamental. This is a, Tocqueville said, every profound transformation is at once political and religious, meaning at once institutional and spiritual. Yes? What do you think of examples like, for instance, the space race? as something that kind of adds to bigness and spurs innovation, but isn't Well, it's a very special example, isn't it? Because it's an escape, uh, escape from what's proximate. So, so, the, so in this circumstance in which littleness is naturalized in these societies, fundamental experience of the individual is the experience that he is belittled, he's humiliated, He's constrained in his day-to-day -day experience. And then he has a second life, a fantasy life, of escape and empowerment in fantasy. This is the powerful element of popular culture. So the question is the extent to which the space race, the escape from the planet, is appealing as a prophecy of our empowerment here on Earth, or as an example of this escape, uh, as an escape from our belittlement. So it's that dialectic which has to be overcome. And so this is something which is intangible, but of immense importance in the understanding of the redirection of our, of our efforts. So we have here a contrast between two ideas of the division between right and left. So on one idea, which is the idea that came to prevail in the second half of the 20th century, uh, the leftist is the one who accords priority to equality against the background of the established arrangement and who is the humanizer of the inevitable, the inevitable being the existing structure. And so the goal is greater corrective equality, humanization, and the structural presupposition is the acceptance of some barely adjusted version of the present institutions. And uh, the alternative interpretation of the division between the right and the left <coughs> is that the division has to do with the goal and with the method. So the goal is that we ascend together to a higher form of life. Not just an elite of geniuses, heroes, saints, successful inventors and entrepreneurs. We, we can ascend only if we ascend together. That's the goal. And the struggle against inequality is subsidiary to that goal. We become more human by becoming more godlike. We increase our quota in the attribute of transcendence. And in secular terms, it's the enhancement of agency, of the capacity to act against and beyond the context. And the struggle against inequality is accessory to that goal. And the method is structural change, which, for, to, for it to be real, must be fragmentary. It's not the fantasy of the wholesale transformation of an order. That's what it would mean to be left. And by that criterion, of course, the vast majority of the progressive forces in the world are conservative, not progressive, right, not left. So it's a redefinition of the line of division, which risks creating a situation in which there's almost no one on the other side. Uh, 
but that's the, the, the it's, it's toward that argument that I'm reaching. And so that it seems more proximate to us, to our historical circumstance, I'm trying to give it a context, a setting. Yes? So I'm thinking a lot about this idea of the level of our ambition for human life. And it yes. seems to me that consumption has become such a central part of our ambition for human life. Um, and I, the way I think about it, it's you had mass production, industrial mass production, but then also came along mass communication, and then came mass consumption as kind of this driver of human life. How are we going to replace that with this notion of being bigger together and being bigger together not meaning just consuming more? Because consuming is not what we really want, right? It's a proxy for other things. What do we want? We want the absolute. The unconditional, the unlimited. And what do we find? The limited, the relative, the conditional. That's us. Uh, and uh, what's, what's the correct response to this situation? So politics, when it's serious, is ultimately about who we are. Who we are, who we can become, what we should become, what we should make ourselves into, uh, and what's the level of our ambition. So. The, this is the fundamental objection to historical social democracy, that it, it takes us at too large a discount, that we're not as ordinary as we seem to be. And so there's this contest, this is a spiritual contest, and it's inseparable from these debates about alternatives. So I do want, I will continue in the first half of class next week, this discussion, and um, and I want to relate it to a discussion about Europe, the future of the European Union, and to return to the spiritual theme.